Yes, I'm ready. Share screen. Okay, thank you. Uh, Hello, everyone. We're really glad to have Aram Aramian here speaking to us. Our, some time ago, we surveyed the members of our White Pine chapter of the Idaho Native Plant Society. I'm the president, so I got to look at those results, and um, some of the concerns were really pronounced um, for the Native Palouse Prairie, uh, for wetlands and open ponderosa pine, but especially for white bark pine. And there were lots of questions about the effects of the blister rust resistance breeding um, program that's um, started here uh, in Northern Idaho. Um, what are the implications of that for the Western white pine um, in the future? So I'm really delighted to have Aram uh, here in his job as a manager of the Forest Service Nursery in Coeur d'Alene, as he'll explain, they grow a lot of blister rust resistant tree seedlings because they have a program to select those trees um, for seed and seedlings. I've known Aaron for a long time. He, and I, he earned his master's degree here at the University of Idaho. And I was um, glad to be a grad student with him because he has a great sense of humor but especially I love the way that he always was thinking about the future. And when we were out doing prescribed fires, he was always wondering, well, what about the trees? What's gonna happen? What kind of trees should be planted here? What's, what's gonna happen to this area in the future? So I think you're gonna learn a lot from Aram tonight and I am happy to, have him, to introduce him. Before I do though, I first have to apologize. It was my technical error that meant that we had to re-record this. So, Aram, thank you for that. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Aram. Okay. Thank you, Penny. Um, I'm always um, happy to um, help you out in any way, shape, or form. I mean, um, the bonds that we made back while we were in grad school last a lifetime. So, um, for my talk, I'm going to talk about um, breeding and raising uh, white pine seedlings and white bark pine seedlings. Um, give a little history on how the blister rust program got started and also talk a little bit about uh, the native plant, the native plant program that we do at the Coeur d'Alene Nursery. So um, with that, I will move on. So the Coeur d'Alene Nursery is one of six nurseries um, in the Forest Service system. Um, we are up here in obviously Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. The other nursery in Idaho is Lucky Peak. They're down by Boise. Um, the Bessie Nursery is in Nebraska. The Toomey Nursery is in um, the um, Upper Peninsula in Michigan. Uh, the, the Ben Seed Extractory is one of the two seed extractories. The other one is the Ash Seed Extractory down in Mississippi. Uh, the J. Herbert Stone Nursery is in uh, Medford, Oregon. Placerville Nursery is in Placerville, California. Combined, uh, we provide collectively all the seedlings for the national forests in the West and in the East. Um, Toomey covers most of Region 9. Um, there are limited nurseries in Region 8, which would be down in, in uh, the Southeast portion here that I'm showing, which goes all the way over to Texas. And then you can see the uh, green lines here are showing where where our influence is and, and what zones we cover. Coeur d'Alene is in region one. Region one is all of Idaho down to the time zone change in Riggins, all of Montana. And we go a little bit into uh, the Dakotas. So um, it's, it's a wonderful system. It works out really well for all of us. And we share, uh, especially the nurseries on the West, if one nursery has an order that they can't fill, uh, another nursery has space, they take that on. And, and so we really um, cooperate and work as a team in the nursery system. So over the last, uh, uh, close to the last 20 years, this is kind of the uh, scale of production that, that we have seen. Our numbers are, they kind of go up and down and it just depends on uh, what activities have occurred that disturb the, uh, that cause the disturbance that we need to reforest for. Uh, lately, a lot of it has been fires, but 
most of it has been uh, uh, timber sales, timber harvest. Um, and it's different in different regions. This is, you know, a picture of region one. I know in California, it's more related to the wildfires that they have. And um, in Oregon, it's a little bit different in, in, in that region. So um, more towards timber harvest there. Um, for us, this is kind of, um, as a nursery, we grow Barrett seedlings, which are seedlings that are grown outside, uh, containerized seedlings, seedlings in the greenhouse, um, and also our native plant seedlings. So these are um, kind of our clients for Barrett seedlings. We grow seedlings okay. for Region 1, Region 6, and the Bureau of Land Management. Uh, for container crops, we grow <laughs> for Region 1. Region 2, Region 6, Bureau of Land Management, and the National Park Service. And for native plants, um, we grow native plants for Region 6 and Region 1. We also do a little bit for the, um, the tribes. We're um, growing some um, um, rooted willows and, and other shrubs for the Nez Perce tribe for uh, rehabilitation, restoration work you know, in riparian areas. Uh, we also got into an interesting project here recently, which I'll talk about later, but it has to do with canvas bulbs. Um, but that's kind of the general overview of, of what we do here. So Western white pine, first I want to talk about um, how, we, uh, how much we grow, what we grow, um, and the fact that all the seed that we use to grow seedlings is from seed orchards that were developed from rust screening trials. So uh, this map shows the uh, boundaries of white pine, uh, where the breeding zone is. So anywhere in this zone um, is where white pine could grow. So if you collected seed from a white pine here, you could plant those seedlings back anywhere within this zone. Um, white pine is a generalist. There's no differentiation between elevation, latitude, longitude. It'll grow anywhere that there is a moderate site with uh, proper moisture and uh, uh, good soils. So this has been the production since 2018. Um, you know, we're some years are growing close to a million uh, seedlings. Um, the bulk of it has been, it's been more a container here recently. Um, than Barrett seedlings. Um, and historically, we've grown more than a million white pine seedlings a year. This is just a short the last five, six years uh, to give you an idea of what our current production rate is. Um, acres planted. Uh, this is a, a graph of how many acres have been planted of two white pine. This is region one, region five, and region six, region five is a little bit. Uh, region six um, also has a, a good share of, of white pine habitat. And region one, we've probably planted over 134,000 acres uh, sent up through 2023. So I mentioned a little earlier that uh, all of our seed uh, comes from seed orchards and Historically, um, the first seed orchards were started in the uh, um, early 70s and even earlier than that. Um, some of them were started in the 1960s as uh, breeding orchards. Um, they, were, they were created from uh, trees that they selected from out in the woods that appeared to show resistance and um, put in this breeding orchard in uh, Moscow, the orchard in Moscow, which is the Richard T. Bingham orchard now, uh, that was initially a forest service orchard. And, um, but first it was a breeding orchard where we were um, making crosses, uh, getting seed from those crosses and testing them to see how resistant they were to blister rust. And then later on, we uh, changed that into a seed orchard and that's predominantly that orchard and the sand, there was a sand point orchard that was started at about the same time. That was predominantly where we received our first um, seed for growing white pine. And then over time, um, we started orchards. Um, we had one orchard here in Coeur d'Alene. Um, we had 
two additional orchards at Lone Mountain, and they were established initially uh, by elevational bands. And later on, when we found out that White Pine was a generalist, we um, no longer were concerned about um, elevation uh, anymore, but we still kept the seed lots separate from each orchard because they had a little bit different representation of the families. Um, all the initial orchards were started from a small number of families and um, the blister rust has a, can mutate and it can get around some of the resistance mechanisms that the initial families uh, had expressed in their genes. So uh, the second phase of our, our program was to uh, get a broader collection of seed uh, from parent trees from out in the woods. So we we went out and collected um, additional plus trees, collected the seed from those and um, tested those individuals, which I'll talk about later. But our orchards now, um, they're at Grouse Creek. Our, uh, we have well over four or 500 families represented in those orchards. So we have a very broad genetic base. Um, it's a good hedge against if the rust were to mutate and get around some of the resistance mechanisms, we would have um, ample mechanisms represented that we can assure that those seedlings that we're generating um, would be resistant. So, um, palms of seed of white pine. Um, this is our seed bank. Um, we can go through um, a couple hundred pounds a year, depending on the, um, the the sowing request that we receive. So right now our seed bank has about 340 pounds of seed in the seed bank. And this is, realistically, this is a two or three year supply. Fortunately for us, white pine has a large crop every third year. Um, last year was a very down year. So we're hoping that we can bolster our supply in the bank um, and just continue this process. So, so now I'm going to give you a short history of blister rust. Um, depending on what you read, um, um, they say that the seedlings came, uh, seedlings that were infected with rust, but we didn't know they were infected, came from either France or Germany. I'm just going to say the seedlings uh, were grown in Europe and um, they were um, brought to the uh, British Columbia and, and planted there. And the seedlings were infected with blister rust and then uh, the infection spread to the alternate host, which is Ribe species. And uh, in the Pacific Northwest, we have a large, um, a large population of uh, three different species of ribes in the Pacific Northwest. So um, there was a map that I was looking, uh, but I couldn't find it. And it showed the progression um, over the over the century of how many years it took to get all the way down into Idaho. Um, so the infected seedlings spread the spores onto the alternate host. The alternate host um, turned around and produced the spores that turn around and reinfect the, uh, the seedlings. And over time, the disease spread into the historic range of uh, Western white pine. From the 1930s forward, ribes eradication was underway and it was done by the, uh, partly by the uh, Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, and then there was a blister rust um, camps that were established. There was one one big one at Priest Lake and there were several um, throughout the um, range of white pine. And um, in the 40s and 50s, um, a lot of people, a lot of kids earn college money uh, by pulling ribes or trying to eradicate ribes. Uh, we were also spraying um, white pine seedlings to prevent um, infection from ribes plants. But about 1967, they figured out that, you know what, we're never going to remove all of the ribes plants that are, are currently growing in these habitats. So um, that went away in 1967. In 1956, Richard Bingham, he was with the Bureau of Entomology and Plant Quarantine in Spokane. 
he and two colleagues noticed that when they drove around in the woods and they saw all these stands that were um, dead from blister rust, there were individuals in those stands that were um, showed no no indication of the disease, and they they were alive and vigorous and growing well, and um, so they figured, well, these must have some mechanism that um, can resist the blister rust. So they collected um, um, cyan material from these and they grafted them and they uh, created that breeding orchard I spoke of earlier, in, which is now the Moscow seed orchard. And they crossed these individuals with each other and um, took the seed and grew the seedlings and purposely infected them with blister rust and followed them over time. And what they were seeing was that those seedlings were indeed uh, showing resistance to blister rust. So that initial step that he took is basically what our program is, um, is has been founded on and is what we continue to do. We do it on a larger scale, um, but um, it's it's the same same process and um, when Dick was still alive they they had a tour of the nursery um, as the rust busters they called themselves and and I asked him you know how he started this and he said well you know he, what I told you he said and I wrote this proposal and I sent it to the Washington office and they said okay Dick do it he says well then we had to figure out how to do it so I'm I'm really thankful that they um, developed this process because it, it made our jobs a little easier. Um, the volume that we do was much greater than the initial um, test that he did, but um, it's because of what he had done is how we're so successful today. So these two maps are the same. Um, one is a, um, the green one shows the range of white pine in the in the Pacific Northwest and down into California. I grabbed the larger one because it shows all the counties in Idaho um, where white pine um, was historically present. So, um, and you can see here it's Clearwater County and it's completely shaded in. So um, white pine was a, was a key component um, in our habitats in, in Northern Idaho. So, I uh, can't talk about blister rust without telling you how it infects the seedling. So down here in um, at A, the spores from the rivies plants uh, in the uh, fall, they uh, come and infect the uh, needles of the white pine and they get into the stomata and they grow down the stem, uh, grow down the needles and into the stem. And what the disease is trying to do is is um, girdle a stem, and so if the if the seedling doesn't have the genes to uh, resist the uh, disease from growing down the stem, it'll get into the stem, it'll form a canker, and it'll form these blisters. And in the springtime of the sec of the next second year. Um, these blisters will um, swell up and they uh, pop and they send their spores out into the air and they get onto the ribes plants again and the inoculum infects the underside of the leaves and they grow all summer and then in the fall again when it's um, humid from rain and, and um, moist they will release and the process continues and this cycle just goes around and around and around. So what we do is we artificially recreate this cycle when we're testing seedlings. So um, the first thing we need, obviously, is we need seed. So um, I mentioned earlier that we made collections of all these individual trees from out in the woods. This is just one seed drawer, every packet has seed from an A plus tree that uh, was out in a white pine stand, showed uh, no appearance of blister rust. And so um, we brought it into our um, program and we are testing these individuals. 
So from the seed, we grow the seedlings and we have to grow the seedlings for two years. Um, we grow 144 seedlings of, of each individual plus tree. Um, and those are um, put into the test. And um, unlike um, the early stuff, we're testing 200 families at a time. So total seedlings that we are looking at is probably 25 to 30,000, could be up to 30,000 seedlings that, that we are doing inspections on. So, so seedlings grow for two years. We uh, randomize the seedlings into reps and to get them ready for inoculation. The other thing we do is, of course, we have a ribes garden. And when I tell people that, they look at me kind of strange. Um, our ribes garden is um, made up of um, three varieties. Um, there's um, stinking currant, which is ribes Hudsonian, and Hudson, Hudsonian. Uh, we have um, sticky currant, which is Ribes lacustra, and we have stinking currant, which is Ribes visca system. And sticky currant and stinking currant are the upland species, and Hudsonianum is the one that is in the riparian zones. And it is probably capable of producing a uh, hundred times more spores than the other two. But uh, it's important to note that all three are in the white pine habitat types. So um, blister rust, the alternate host is always there and can always contribute. And you can see on this row, you can see the yellow of the of the inoculum on the underside of the leaves, and um, it it um, is spreads over the whole entire leaf. It, it covers the leaves, and and uh, it really makes a good inoculum. So, so we have two year old seedlings that are ready to be inoculated. We go up and we harvest leaves um, when the spores are at the proper state on the underside of the leaves. And then we bring them into the nursery and we set up our inoculation chamber. And so uh, the seedlings are underneath this table. The, it's a screen. The leaves are laid down on the screen with the inoculum on the underside. We put this moist blanket over the top. Uh, we raise the humidity in this tree cooler to um, high levels, uh, close to 90% and uh, maintain the temperature at 60 degrees and let it drop a little bit. And we found over time that that's when the spores drop. Over here on this picture, there is a um, spore monitoring station. So we have microscope slides in our uh, inoculation test. And we pull slides every, um, and there's several slide uh, locations to try and get a, a total measure of what's going on. Um, and we're looking for 10,000 spores per square centimeter. So we take the slides, put them under a microscope, and we count how many spores we see on the slide. And once we get to 10,000 or 15,000, then we will pull the trays off the top of the, of the seedlings and let them sit there in that moist environment to allow the spores to uh, infect the needles. And then we'll take them out after about two days, put them back in the greenhouse and let them finish growing and let them go dormant. At that time, we will uh, unrandomize the seedlings, put them back in their family groups and um, box them up by replication so that they're ready for planting the following spring. And so this is how we plant the seedlings. We use an auger. Uh, we have a, a dibble that um, has the spacing and we uh, drill 36 holes uh, at most uh, for each family. Um, and we can get down as few as 16, but we, uh, depending on how well the seed germinated. So we have, um, this would be one family being tested. This would be another and all the way down the line. And you can see this field is very long and this, this test had about 22,000 seedlings in it. So, so we plant the seedlings in May. 
Um, we allow them to grow for a month or so. And then in June, we start our first rust inspection. And this is what we are hoping to see. We are hoping to see needle spots on uh, last year's needles. And these are the ones that were infected by the spores. And this is the new growth this year. So um, we have data recorders. We, we do a um, full screening and then we check about a quarter of the seedlings in that family or a third of the seedlings in that family. And we do detailed measurements um, on those seedlings. Um, and we'll do another inspection in the fall. In the fall, we'll start to see if um, this seedling no longer has needles that have uh, needle spots that would tell us that this has a gene that can shed infected needles before it gets down into the stem. If they continue to have um, spotted needles and they grow down into the stem, then we can see whether it starts to form a canker um, with the fall inspection of the first year. And then the next inspection is the fall of the next year. And then the final inspection is the fall of the third year. And so what we're looking for is um, this would be evidence of a canker that formed on the on the tree. So this one didn't have a needle shed. Um, we're looking um, to see if this canker can be uh, watered off by the by the seedling. They can form a callus tissue around the canker and actually cause a dead spot. And that's what you're seeing here. This would be a bark reaction but this above it is still active. Um, here's another example where you can see the, the orange stem and the large um, swelling in the stem. And so this is still an active canker. Here's a tree that died from blisteros early on. So this, this is the second or third, sec, probably end of the second year of the growing season. And just to give you an idea of what this looks like, this is the third year um, a look down from above. So you can see there's some families that are still very green. Uh, and you can see other families that are not so green. And so that gives you, I mean, in in just basic terms, these are less resistant than these individuals. Um, and so now they're doing the final inspection and they have a yardstick and they're also measuring the height. So we're selecting the the tallest individuals that have shed the disease. Um, those are the ones that go into our seed orchards. Um, the remainder of the ones in the stand that, that uh, we didn't select for seed orchard material, they go into a long-term field test and we, we will track their progress over time. And so all these individuals, when they're planted in a long-term test, they're cataloged by the family number and the rep and row and column of where they are in that plantation. And they're measured every five years or so um, for about 25, 30 years at least. And um, if anything were to happen where all of a sudden we saw just a mass die off from blister rust, um, we can go back to our, our orchards um, and decide whether we want that individual in the orchard or maybe make some control crosses um, to try and uh, bolster the resistance. So, so once everything is, is final measurement, the data is um, crunched, so to speak, is analyzed, and the, the final selections are made. We go in and we, uh, prior to this little episode here, we go in and we flag all the individuals that want to save. Uh, we put a tag on them identifying what individual it is, where it came out of the uh, rust screening trial, what row column and what replication it was from. And these will be our seed orchard trees. Um, and this the shorter ones uh, will be our long-term field trials. So these are lifted and this is the seedling lifter and we have to pull them up with a crew. We put them in tubs, we bring them into our packing shed and we uh, check the seedlings once again uh, to make sure that there's no active cankers. Uh, we prune the roots, we box them and get them ready for shipment to either 
the seed orchard site or the field plantation. Um, I haven't gone into breeding yet, but that's next. So with white pine breeding, um, the, the one thing we need is pollen. This is actually ponderosa pine pollen, but we have large vials of white pine pollen as well in our uh, tree freezer. Um, so we have the pollen and we also have a breeding orchard. So this is the breeding orchard. This is made up of individuals that um, pass the rust screening trial. Uh, we, we grafted individuals and put them in this um, breeding orchard. There's four individuals per family represented in this orchard. And um, this is comprised of oh, several uh, rust screening cycles. I think we were up to cycle 22 was the last one we did for white pine. So in this, uh, we are doing the same thing that Dick Bingham did back in the late 50s and early 60s. Um, we uh, come out in late May. Uh, we can actually see the reproductive flowers. They look like uh, little mini cones. Uh, we'll put this, this pollination bag over them so that no natural pollen from white pine, because we have some white pine around, and these white pine will also produce pollen. So we don't get any crosses that um, um, we didn't manage ourselves. We have a breeding design. So this individual has four or five pollen parents that we want to cross with this. So each year we will take one of the pollen parents and pollinate the flowers with this squeeze bulb and this uh, little tube with a uh, hypodermic with a, a, a IV needle on it. And uh, you just squeeze the bulb gently and put a little puff of pollen in there on these flowers when they look like this, they look like miniature cones. Um, if you totally cover these things with pollen and it turns this yellow, you've put too much pollen on them and you can cause the um, flowers to abort and they won't produce any seeds. So uh, a successful pollination, once we see the uh, cone scales turn upwards, we uh, can remove the bags and we'll put a tag on them. And then the next year we'll come back and collect the cones, process the seed. And then we will turn around and run these crosses through a rust screening trial. And the individuals that um, come out of that rust screening trial are gonna be the next generation um, seed orchard material. They should have a higher level of resistance um, because we've taken two known parents and cross them. So right now, resistance level in white pine from our first generation orchards is about 30 to 35 percent. Um, uh, we're hoping to get up to 60 percent and maybe even higher. So, so now we'll talk about white bark pine. And um, white bark pine is also susceptible to blister us, but um, it does have a higher level of resistance to blister rust than white pine does. And uh, it averages about 40 to 45% um, from um, the stands that it is growing in uh, in Northern Idaho and, and Montana. Um, so first of all, I'll talk about production. Um, this is a, um, a graph of the um, first year and second year. Um, it's a two-year product. Um, it takes two years to grow a seedling that um, will survive out in the woods. So um, the orange line is the two-year, um, what we shipped out. The blue line is the um, sowing request that we received. So in any given year, uh, we have a total of close to 300,000 seedlings growing, half of them being two-year-old uh, two seedlings or seedlings going into the second year. Half of them are seedlings that we actually sow in March and um, get their first year's growth. Um, this is um, our entire production where we really got started, 2003, 
uh, we grew about 30,000 and then it dropped off, dropped off. And then all of a sudden, um, people uh, receive funds to collect more white bark seed um, from out in the woods. And there were a lot of things that were going on. Um, box nutcrackers were preying on the seed and grizzly bears are preying on the seed, but we um, actually developed some cages that prevented the Clark's nutcracker from uh, robbing all the seed. And I think that bolstered our ability to collect more seed. So, um, uh, which in turn allowed us to produce more seedlings. So over the last, since 2009, we've really been um, heavily involved in producing uh, white bird seedlings. Initially, um, the seedlings, the seed was collected from individuals. The, the direction was to collect from individuals uh, that showed no appearance of blister rust. Um, after, during that time, we also had our, our uh, clients uh, select plus trees like we did in white pine, but select uh, white bark pine trees. And they collected the seed from those trees. They collected pollen from those trees. And we basically duplicated what we do with white pine. So we cut the seed. We grew the required number of seedlings. We had 200 families represented in the first rust screening. We've done five rust screenings of, with 200 families each. So we've tested a thousand parents out there. Um, and um, we've actually developed, started seed orchards um, from this as well. So there's um, seed orchards in um, on the Gallatin Forest, on the Lolo Forest, on the Bitterroot and Flathead. And I think there's one on the Panhandle as well. So, and the Clearwater, the Nez Clearwater. Um, so we've been pretty busy with white bark pine. Um, here's uh, acres planted by region. So region one, um, this is um, two up until 2023. So we're looking at 77, roughly 7,700 acres. Um, region two, which is uh, you know, Colorado, um, a little bit of Wyoming, um, region four is all of uh, Southern Idaho, Utah, and region six has some white uh, bark pine as well. And then the Bureau of Land Management in Montana has also started, um, uh, we grow a lot of seedlings for them and they've been uh, putting rust resistant uh, seedlings back into their habitats as well. So, um, this is a, um, just a shot of um, one-year-old seedlings going to their second growing season. There's probably about 185,000 seedlings um, in this house and they'll grow for another year. We put a shade cover over this in June because white bark pine doesn't like it hot. Uh, they have to keep it cool. And, um, and it's, a, it's a process, but um, you know we see great results when these are out planted. So blister us on white bark pine. Um, again, like I said earlier, it's the same process. We grow two and possibly even three trays of seedlings. This is the first year um, going to the second year. Um, it's a two-year two -year crop to get the seedlings up big enough to have the um, secondary needles um, for the target for blister us uh, to infect. We do the same thing. We um, uh, collect the uh, inoculate the Ribes garden in the summer and early June. Um, collect the leaves in the fall. Randomize the seedlings into four replications. We put them in the same environment that we do uh, white pine rust screening. Put the infected leaves over the crop on the screens. Cover them with the wet muslin, and monitor the um, monitor the seed the spore drop. So. Um, and it's and the screening is the same process. I just want to show you some um, some later um, um, evidence of blister rust. So over here on this branch, this black um, portion right here, this is actually a bark reaction. This um, formed a callus around the infection of the canker and killed it. 
and, and that's what you see, this sunken tissue. Um, this is still has an active canker because you can see this orange margin here and down here it's swollen. Um, you can still see um, the needle spots here on this one and that's how this got infected. But this growth here, it's also trying to ward off the infection from growing into the stem. This is um, another callus tissue that forms on the on the um, the stem, so of the of the fascicle. And here's another uh, active canker over here on this one. Um, again, most of the cankers you you'll see pitch and then you see this swollen appearance. Um, again, here the same thing, white bark. Um, and this has a little of everything. It has the cankers, it has um, pitch, and it also has the, the needles on it. So it's the same, same type of inspection that we do. Um, we, we plant them the same way. We do an initial inspection in June, second inspection that fall, third inspection the following fall, and the final inspection um, a year later. So. Um, I mentioned we have seed orchards. This is one seed orchard. Uh, we fenced it here, um, and the, the seedlings are in here and growing. We've actually, um, they've gone back to the parent tree that the seed came from. We grafted those individuals onto rootstock um, from the same seed zone, and uh, they've planted those into an orchard setting, and we're just trying to speed up the production of seed from white bark because it may take 30 to 40 years for a, a white bark um, to start to produce cones where white pine you may start to see cones in 15 years um, so we're trying to speed up that time frame to where we could get rust resistant seed sooner for white bark as well as white pine and uh, um, the history of seed production at the nursery, um, we began dabbling, I'll say, with uh, white bark seed in 1985. Um, since 1985, we've probably processed over 3,500 pounds of seed. Currently, we have 218 separate seed lots in the bank with 2,519 pounds of seed. Um, white bark pine, um, is different than all of our other cones that we process. Um, our other cones, we get the cones in and we put them on a kiln so that we can flare the cone scales and that allows the seed to drop out and we can run it through a tumbler. In the early years, we tried that with white bark pine. We put the cones on the kiln and they just got harder. And then we had people hitting them with hammers and we knew that wasn't the way to go. So, um, we finally figured out that procrastination is the key. We had one year where we had 3,000 bushels of conifer cones that came in, and we just set all the white bark cones aside on drying racks out in our cone sheds. And it was December that we finally got around to um, processing the white bark pine. And they brought the bags in, and uh, the cones had dried out sufficiently so that we could just crumble them by hand. Uh, the seed just dropped out in the bottom, and it's a very large seed. Um, and so that really sped up uh, the cleaning process for white bark pine. I mentioned earlier, it's a two-year product. Um, the seed is hand-sown. Um, we put them in these containers because if uh, we don't get, uh, if the seed lot doesn't germinate well, we can consolidate the lot. Uh, we can eliminate the empty cells. Uh, empty cells are vectors for things like fungus gnats and diseases. So we can get that out of there and keep the crop clean. And in this photo, way in the back, there's some two-year-old seedlings that are going to three years old because somebody wanted us to hold those over. And these seedlings are going into their second year of growth. So you can see kind of the growth difference that occurs. Um, and... Um, it's it's more labor intensive than than our other crops of conifers. So on germination is average about 64%, when we can get anywhere from 20 
to 85%. Um, seed germination is the largest obstacle to production. Um, initially, the first attempts we did, we said, well, we'll treat it just like we um, um, treat white pine. So with white pine, we do 118 to 120 day cold moist stratification uh, after we soak the seed for 48 hours in a running water soak. And what that does is it imbibes the seed with, with water and it plumps the seed back up so that it has its full complement of moisture. Um, what we found out using the white pine stratification process is that it didn't work. Um, the first crop we sowed, we got 3% germination. So we said, well, we're gonna have to figure this out. So we went through the literature and we found some other um, literature talking about stratification of other species and um, other people had been working on some of these problems. So we found that there was uh, great promise in a in about a 20-day uh, warm moist stratification followed by uh, the remainder of period as a cold moist stratification. So we did that. Um, and then our early practice was to pre-germinate the seed. And you can see the, the germinants here. Um, so we used to put them all in a germinator. We used to pluck the germinants out. And people, we used to plant the, the germinants. And if you weren't very good at it, and you didn't put this um, straight down into the soil, if it grew for two years and there was a hitch in that, when you went to extract the seedling, it would just break off at that point. And so then you know, we lost income and our client didn't have a seedling to plant. So we um, got away from that. Um, we later um, went through the stratification and then um, somebody said, well, you need to scarify the seed, rough up the seed coat and make it weaker so that the seed can germinate better. Um, we did that for a few years, and it, but it didn't make sense to us because we said, really, you ought to be stratifying the seed at the beginning and not at the end. And so we um, tried something different with one seed lot. We, um, we did the warm, moist strat followed by the cold stratification. And then we placed the seed in perlite in a mesh bag rather than um, in a mesh bag in a plastic bag. We didn't do a scarification and we just planted the seed. And we found out that that was, um, that was the answer because we had healthier seedlings. We had less um, mortality from fungus um, and um, we got more of the, we pulled more of the crop through. So that's our current um, practice. Um, we tweak it a little bit every now and then, but um, this one really works now. Um, we've contributed to the um, overall white bark pine community by writing chapter in uh, um, the white pine ecosystem um, management book. It um, was put out in by the ecosystem, uh, White Bark Ecosystem Foundation. So we wrote the chapter on stratification and, and production of white pine seedling, of white bark pine seedlings. So, um, and we still contribute. I mean, there's always something else that we learn, and um, we give talks at conferences um, on white bark pine. So, the latest thing that's going on with white bark now that it's listed is um, we also have to account for every seed, every seedling, every piece of sign material we get for grafting in every graft that we make and we report that to the Fish and Wildlife Service every year. So, so now native plant production, and this is fitting for the native plant group. Um, we got into native plants um, in the early 2000s because our conifer numbers were down and we we're just trying to figure out what we could do. Um, to fill a gap, we had some space. And so we started first producing um, native plants for restoration work. And then people wanted us to uh, grow seed increase plots. And, and this aster and this, um, I think these are bluebells, um, 
these plots are for collecting seeds. So we'll allow, uh, we'll grow this, make sure the crop is healthy, we'll water it occasionally, we'll let the flowers die off and collect the seed heads. Um, this one was really interesting. This is for um, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. They wanted us to grow um, these for, um, it's milkweed. We want, they wanted us to grow this for seed and they were going to um, plant milkweed seed on some of their um, sites to encourage um, pollinators um, to come back. So um, we did that as well. That was interesting. And we noticed that we had a lot more butterflies and uh, in bees and other pollinators that we had never seen before when we started doing this out in the field. So this is what our native plant greenhouse looks like in the foreground is some carrots and some grasses. And then we get into uh, rooted cuttings, um, um, crops from seed. So we'll do um, elderberry from seed. Uh, in the background, there's willow, dogwood, cottonwood. Um, we do aspen from um, people give us root segments and we pluck the um, germinants off the off the root segments and root them. Um, um, but if they would actually find aspen seed, um, aspen seed works even better. Um, the aspen seed is ready in the spring, which is a ring, a different um, than say birch seed or some of the other hardwoods. And um, we can sow the seed and in, in, in the next day aspen seed comes up. So, um, so we do a lot of um, riparian habitat stuff, um, a lot of rooted cuttings. We do dogwood, cottonwood, willows. Um, we do snowberries, um, woods rose, um, uh, a number of other species. And, and it's, it's really variable um, what it's used for. And I mentioned in the beginning that we grow a lot of uh, species for um, uh, the Nez Perce tribe and the Coeur d'Alene tribe. And, and currently we're growing canvas bulbs and getting them up to size. And they're going to take those and plant those in historic um, canvas harvesting areas and, and try and get that um, and practice back um, and uh, going again. So um, we've grown bog, bog violets uh, for someone else. We've grown sagebrush, we've grown other dryland species, and we just have to take the, those crops and put them outside so they're not under the irrigation system because um, they need a really dry environment. So it's been an interesting um, uh, adventure, I'll say. We've learned quite a lot. The other thing we do, and I mentioned this earlier, we do grow um, seed increase plots, and, um, and this is probably everlasting, and somebody wanted us to grow this because they want to incorporate it into their um, seed mixes for uh, restoration on, on some sites. Um, this is a brome. I can't remember which brome it is, but um, people will give us a, you know, a bag, a small bag full of seed and they say, sow this out and I want 500 pounds of, of grass seed that I, native grass seed from my habitats that I can put back on my sites and so we've been doing that we have a small plot combine and when the seed is ready uh, we'll combine it and collect that and bring it into the extractory and um, process the seed get it ready um, and then turn around and put it in seed mixes for them and send it back out to them or if they want us to grow uh, grassy plugs we've done that as well for um, wet bank restoration so Another fun project is, um, this is with the Federal Highways, um, had to do with Snoqualmie Pass, uh, the realignment of Interstate 90. These are six foot, uh, minimum half inch to inch diameter willow whips. And they put these in with an excavator in the head end of the reservoir before you go over Snoqualmie Pass. And they did it in September. And I was thinking, that's way out of you know, biology speaking, that's way out of um, when you would stick cuttings. But um, 
they said, well, this is the only time we can get into the reservoir at the at the head end where we want to put these willows in. And so they did that. And uh, I was there two years later and it was fantastic. I mean, they, they really had a wonderful stand of willows in there. So um, we do a lot of that. Um, we'll, we'll take, we have stooling beds established for the Panhandle, the Flathead, the Kootenai, um, and a few other forests where they'll come in and take cuttings and just stick them directly into the ground or have us root them for them. So, so native seed, um, we have 6,435 pounds of native seed in the bank and 1,991 separate seed lots. Shrub, forb, and grass species, and uh, seed is used to incorporate into seed mixes um, and for plant production. Um, seed lots are from regions one, two, four, and six. Um, so we're covering most of the West. The only one we don't have in here is region five. Um, and it's Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, National Park Service, and tribal governments. And so with that, uh, in closing, this is just a view of our sign out by our front gate. We always welcome uh, people to come take a tour. Summertime is best because everything's in flower. Um, the picture on the right is just a field of western larch, and there's ponderosa pine and white pine either side of it. This is Barrett, um, two-year-old Barrett seedlings that um, are getting, we're getting ready to lift those and put those in a cooler and ship them out the next spring. So with that, I will close and um, take some questions. Thank you very, very much. It's just amazing that uh, the complexity of all those tasks that you get done um, to make a difference for the... Uh... And, I, and I should have said at the beginning, we actually have five programs under one roof. We, so we grow bare root seedlings, we grow outside, we grow containerized seedlings in a greenhouse. We have the native plant function that does both indoor and outdoor stuff. We have a seed extractory and we house the region's 10 year seed supply in a seed bank. And then we have our tree improvement arm that does all the blister us testing uh, and production of seed orchard material. So it's busy. Um, there's, it's only about like two, it. there's only about two weeks in January that we're really quiet, so. Okay, well, I'm glad that you were able to make time to come and speak to us because as I said in the introduction, um, our members are really interested in the Western white pine and white bark pine um, uh, species and uh, what the implications are of the blister rust. Um, and that really is my first question. So again, for the audience, uh, this is a recording. We had to make uh, Aram kindly did his presentation twice because of a technical error on my part. So what I'm going to do now is ask the questions that came from the audience, at least some of them. So uh, Aram, the first question was really about the long-term outlook for Western white pine and white bark pine. Um, what is the likelihood if these R resistant tree seedlings get planted out there and they produce seeds? And yeah, you know, what's are the are you hopeful that the next generation will be even more resistant? Yes. Um, if you think about it, all the seedlings that we are growing have some level of rust resistance. So as we plant them uh, back out on the site. Um, and as they grow and start producing flowers, pollen flowers and cone flowers, they will actually cross with each other. And we're hoping um, they act like a breeding orchard that they um, can at least maintain the same level of resistance or magnify it. So the seed that comes off of those should be resistant as well. Okay. One of the challenges I think with white bark pine is it often grows in places where you can't plant very well. Um, I'm especially intrigued that you grow a lot of white bark pine for the national parks, Glacier, uh, Yellowstone, and Grand Teton. Mm -hmm. And um, do they plant a lot 
there and how do they manage to do so in places that are really far from roads? They, um, uh, they're quite, quite creative. They horse pack um, seedlings in, you know, that I've seen um, planters with boxes of our seedlings on the back of mules going into these um, sites. Um, and um, they have to pick and choose at some sites um, because it's so rocky. They have to find the uh, soils uh, that are deep enough. And, and we do different size uh, root plugs. Um, they can tell us, you know what, we don't need a six inch plug. Can you put it in a four inch plug for us? Um, and one of our, one of our forest service clients that told me one time, yeah, we're using a rock bar and we're, um, we're prying things open. And I, I said, I hope you're kidding me. Um, uh, but for glacier and, and Yellowstone's probably a little better off, but for glacier, they have identified some plus trees. They make, um, seed collections from those trees. And we and they've been tested in our rest resistant uh, screening trails, and so um, they'll they'll order maybe three or four thousand seedlings, and they'll go back and reforest um, a certain area each year. Um, so they're continually, you know, working in small areas um, and getting white bark pine back into those sites. Yellowstone was a little more aggressive, um, but they aren't as um, they don't order seedlings every year from us. They, they may have a bigger planting project and they'll order a larger volume of seedlings and plant them. Great. I remember some years ago that in Glacier, um, the biologist declared white bark pine functionally extinct because uh, it wasn't providing enough um, that had so much blister rust and infection and fires that they were um, not providing enough seed to the grizzly bears, especially. So right. I know that that's one of their long-term concerns is um, providing the, you know, getting the plants back, but also the uh, supply of food for the grizzly bears. Right. And, and we have um, breeding zones or seed zones for um, populations. So um, they have more, um seed from other trees that may not be in the park that are at their um that they could use as well so they can bring in a little bit um different genetics in there um thank you i have a couple more questions one was um you talked about the ribes mm -hmm. How, what is the is the blister rust infection on the ribes uh, detrimental to the ribes? It is not. Um, typically what happens is uh, if, a knee, if a leaf is infected, at the end of the year, it'll just drop off and, um, and, they'll, and it doesn't have any detrimental effect on the plant. Um, I, I look at my raspberries and I think a lot of uh, that, Ribes plants are as tough as raspberries. Um, the only difference is that raspberries die and a new cane comes up and whereas ribes plants, they just keep growing. Um, they never, the stems never die off. Okay. So I think all it does is add mulch. <laughs> it's, it's certainly striking that um, I read once that you only need one ribes plant per acre to yeah. have enough pollen, I mean, enough um, spores of the blister yep. to infect yep. the white, white bark pine or the white western white pine. Yes. It, and I understand why they stopped trying eradication because um, I've been in places where there's just a sea of ribes plants and, and uh, if you don't get all the roots, they'll just spring right back, so. Yeah. Okay. Um, we might take you up on the on the field trip. Can you tell me again when would be the best time to come? Um, um, May or June or even into July. Um, everything is in flower and um, our field plots as well as um, plants indoors. And then all of our conifers and our greenhouses are up and out in our buried fields are up. So um, there's a lot to see. That sounds wonderful. Well, thank you, Aram. I really uh, greatly appreciate and um, the presentation and 
uh, really appreciate that your work, uh, yeah. that you are so successful. The, the, uh, somebody told me a long time ago, your career finds you. And I think now I believe I know what that means. So, um, <laughs> um, and I'm happy to talk about the nursery. Um, and so uh, we like to show off what we do. And you have a lot to show. So again, thank you very much. I'll uh, stop us recording now and, um, but hang on for a moment and I'll visit with you.